Brook Church. Welcome to everybody online. Did she just say our first ever cornhole tournament? Did I hear that right? That's awesome. Uh, so my name is Matt, as she said. Uh, my family has been around Meadowbrook about six months now, but we've always attended first service. So this is the first time I'm seeing some of you second service people. It's great to be here. You'll learn more about me during the message, so I'm going to jump right in. So hard to believe in two days, the calendar is going to say August. Summer always goes so fast. And when I was a kid, August meant one thing. Any guesses? School, right? It meant back to school. And this last August, um, it was 20 years since back to school meant going away to college for me. When I arrived to Carroll College in August 2002, I think the main question I was pursuing was how do I become somebody? How do I move from being a kid to a grown-up, to an adult, mature, maybe even significant? To me at that time, college offered the knowledge, the wisdom, the know-how to become somebody. And to my 18 or 19-year-old self, becoming somebody could happen a few different ways. First, it could happen through the right knowledge, which could lead to the right degree, the right profession, a job that was stable and provided and exciting. The right knowledge could also mean simply getting smarter, becoming an intellectual or sort of philosopher so you could successfully navigate the puzzle or game of life. To my college peers, they taught me that... Uh, that experience could make me somebody. Concert tickets like Taylor Swift, just kidding, she wasn't around back then, or, or going to parties or road trips with buddies. But the path that I was initially most interested in to becoming somebody was the path of becoming a college basketball player, if that wasn't already obvious. And that path, for somebody this tall and this skinny, was a path of discipline, and a lot of hard work. I think there was sort of status for me that would come with that, a sort of coolness. And that was something I was after too, being cool. And that also took a lot of hard work. Where I did not expect to find a special wisdom or knowledge on how to become somebody was through a kid that lived in my dorm named Andrew. Now, Andrew seemed to be a sort of goofball or even oddball. And as far as I could tell, he was not on the path to becoming somebody. I worked hard to get really tan in the summer. And when Andrew went outside, sometimes he covered his nose with this, like, opaque white zinc oxide. I carefully styled my hair, and Andrew would cover his with this goofy hat that he would wear while he rode his long skateboard to class. I was carefully calculated in social situations to be cool. And Andrew was a bit of a prankster. And sometimes he even let out this goofy laugh. Hoo, 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 hoo. Hoo, 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 How embarrassing. However, despite what things looked like on the surface, I went on to learn that Andrew possessed a hidden knowledge or wisdom that transcended any of the knowledge or wisdom I encountered during my college days. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that your, your word is alive and active. It was alive when Paul wrote those words as your Holy Spirit breathed inside of it um, to the church in Colossae, and it's still alive to us today. So, Today we ask you to use your word to make us more alive, to make us more like you, to comprehend who you are and your love for us and how great you are a little better, and to become people more like you. Amen. Kind of like me, in 2002, the Christians in the town of Colossae were growing up and beginning to come of age in the spiritual sense. They were no longer new Christians or baby Christians, but were at least a few years into their walk of faith and starting to move towards maturity. 
More than that, they were coming of age amidst a marketplace of competing knowledge and wisdom. The town of Colossae was a crossroads of travelers, and it was filled with ideas from the east and the west, kind of like the university. So this circumstance is part of why the biblical author Paul writes a letter to them, and that's the letter we've been going through this summer here at Meadowbrook. Paul writes to the Colossian Christians as a sort of loving grandfather or uncle who can't be with them in this critical season, and he wants to encourage them. But he's also concerned. And Paul's letter addresses a similar question to my college question, but with a couple differences. Instead of um, how do I become somebody, Paul pursues the question of how do y'all become mature? Paul's not Southern, but he's y'all plural. <laughs> or how do y'all become fruitful? Fruitful is a concept that Paul uses for maturity, referring to the maturity of becoming like Jesus, full of God's spirit, becoming a person of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. It's with this backdrop, this background question, that we come to Paul's words for us today. So chapter 2, verse 1, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ. So this is the first time in this letter that Paul really starts to get into specifics of what's going on in Colossae. And we, fee and we see this grandfather-like concern start to surface. Verse 4 reads, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. So Paul's audience is in danger of being deceived by cleverly packaged knowledge or information intended to persuade Instead of growing up into people who are more and more like Jesus, the Colossians are in danger of being deceived by a knowledge or wisdom outside of Jesus in the gospel or in addition to Jesus in the gospel. And we know something of this outside knowledge or wisdom based on the rest of the letter and the cultural context. The Gnostics and the Platoist philosophers emphasized the right knowledge as being needed for growth and the most important thing. And the Gnostics emphasize that as a special or secret or hidden wisdom or knowledge. Mystics argued that a kind of experience was the goal, spiritual experience that transcended the physical world. And the traditional Jews argued that the discipline of following the whole law is what achieved or maintained one's status as God's people. They emphasized dietary regulations and observation of special holy days and festivals. These were all emphasized as paths to progress or growth or security or status, paths to becoming somebody in the first century sense. And at their core, they may not be that different than the popular knowledge and wisdom of our day. So amidst these competing persuasive arguments, Paul wants the Colossians to know how hard or intensely he contends for them and for their neighbor adolescent church in Laodicea. That's what he says in verse 1, and part of that is because he cannot be there with them. So my kids are getting older. I have three boys. And the oldest is entering fifth grade next year at a new school where he'll begin to be exposed to new ideas and thoughts, much of it or some of it probably from social media. And I can't be there with him as he's progressively exposed more and more to these things. And thinking about it that way helps me connect with what Paul probably means when he uses that word 
contends, which can also be translated struggles or competes or wrestles. I too want to contend for my growing children as they grow up in this world of deception. Because adolescence can be a little bit naive, right? That just comes with the territory. You don't yet know what's going to happen. For example, last week, my family was up north at our family cabin, which is on a beautiful lake in northern Wisconsin. Anybody like northern Wisconsin? Um, and my 10-year-old and 7-year-old, what they wanted to do the most up north was survive in the wilderness together. <laughs> My seven-year-old has been super into Bear Grylls. He's been reading his books and watching his television show. And there's this island, this awesome little island on the lake. And they tried to convince us to drop him off at that island and pick him up in 24 hours. So here's a picture of them building a lean-to on the island. So we dropped him off at the island and stayed about 100 feet away and picked him up in three hours. But if, if we let them do that, how do you think that would have gone for them? Here's a picture of a spider that we took on the island. That spider was about three inches long, so I know how it would have gone for me. Ah! <laughs> but really, do you think it would have been as fun as they expected? Would it have been safe? But Paul is saying that we too can be like my kids because none of us are completely mature in Christ. We can all say, no, I'm fine. I can handle the influences of the world on my own. We, too, need to be contended for. We need prayer and counsel and relationship with people who are more mature than we are, just like the Colossians and the Laodiceans did. So moving on to verse 2, we see that Paul next states his goal clearly, what he is contending for. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So Paul wants and prays a few things for these growing Christians, and it seems they may be sequential or at least interconnected. Did you notice that? The so that and in order that. So we are going to arrange the ideas around those words and take them one at a time, assuming they connect and even build on each other. So first, Paul prays that they would be encouraged. So this word encouraged can also be translated strengthened. Living in that world and in our world requires a sort of strength and encouragement to grow towards Jesus. And this encouragement or strengthening comes through being united or knit together in relationship, in Christian love. Now, this is interesting to me. Intuitively, I would think that the first thing that people need when they're in danger of being deceived by arguments is the right knowledge, to have the arguments deconstructed and to learn a little more of the right thing or a little deeper. But learning more of the right knowledge isn't the first place that Paul goes. What we need first is to have our relational bonds strengthened with other Christians. So in college, I decided to become a religion minor. I was a physical therapy major. But the religion classes at my college were quite a bit different than the classes I took at church or at my Christian high school. They, in, they uh, focused on textual criticism or the historical critical method which approaches the Bible like any ancient literature, often with the assumption that anything miraculous or supernatural cannot be true. And they were also often taught by uh, people who weren't believers or who were agnostic. So those classes messed me up a bit, and I did not know what to think about several things. So I started seeking out Christians on campus and kind of cornering them and drilling them with questions like, do you believe the Bible is true? Do you believe the whole Bible is true? And how do you know? So this picture, can you find me? This, this picture is a, uh, a picture of, more people laughed at the first uh, session, um, <laughs> but there I am in the corner. This picture is of my InterVarsity Christian Fellowship group on campus. And these poor people, not only did they have to put up with me, but I was cornering and interrogating them. 
and often probably not in the most gentle or kind way. But that goofball Andrew guy, who's not pictured here, he responded to me in a different and unique way. First, he really listened to my questions, and he asked me some thoughtful follow-up questions. And you could tell he really thought out his responses, and he even admitted um, that he didn't know some things or that he wasn't sure or even confused by some things. And there was a kindness to Andrew that I didn't know I needed. I was looking for answers, for cold, hard facts, and he offered some. But Andrew offered himself as a humble and earnest friend, also on the journey of faith-seeking understanding. And that was surprising, unexpected, and so needed. I think it was my first experience of true Christian community away from home. And pretty soon I was sharing my real problems with Andrew. And other people even joined us, and we even started to pray together. And I remember that had a certain power. So let's go back to Paul's words and ideas of fruitfulness and maturity. So our first point is this. The relational bonds of Christian community are the fertilizer of fruitfulness. My relationship with Andrew and other Christians strengthened me against the plausible arguments around me. It's as if the roots of our trees reached out and bonded to each other so that our respective walks of faith were more stable and rooted against the surrounding threats to our Christian growth towards Jesus. So Paul next goes on about his hopes for the Colossians. He says, so that they may have the full riches of a complete understanding. So even though Paul didn't start here, he clearly thinks that understanding and knowledge are important components of Christian growth and stability. The so that suggests that the bonding of those relational roots also makes our branches go, grow higher towards the level of understanding that Paul wants for us. This understanding is so valuable that Paul calls it riches, and he wants us to have all of it. And it results in a greater knowing of the mystery of God, which is Christ, or King Jesus, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. So the mystery is progressively unveiled when our branches grow high enough to see the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is Jesus. He is the mystery of God. He is what Paul has been talking about through chapter 1 of Colossians. Paul says the whole universe was created by him and for him and through him, and he holds all things together, and he's reconciling all things to himself. Paul wants us to see this picture, like branches growing above the understory of the forest and for the first time seeing the whole span of the night sky with countless stars like diamonds stretching as far as the eye can see and all of them pointing to Jesus. So I kept taking my college religion classes and I learned some helpful things in them, but they continued to be hard for me too in some ways. My Hebrew Bible class or Old Testament class was especially challenging. I remember starting to have some serious doubts during that class. And I started telling this to my friend Andrew, and he said, let's go for a walk. I think we may have started that walk with sharing how we spent our summer vacation, um, you know, college guy stuff. Andrew was on the nursing staff at camp, and he told me how he ate daddy long leg spiders in front of first grade kids at camp when they came to the nursing office just to see their reactions. <laughs> and then we moved right from that to talking about my questions. And after after pouring those out, I remember Andrew paused and thought for a moment. And then he said something profound, something to the effect of, your class is focusing on the Old Testament without any talk of Jesus. But Jesus is the point of the Old Testament. He's the point of the Bible, and he is the point of the whole universe. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus when considering the Old Testament or anything else because it's all about Jesus. The story only makes sense when we consider it in light of Jesus. 
So the same guy who just ate spiders for first graders at summer camp said those words to me. And when he said them, something happened to me. I remember it well. There was a sort of relief or peace, a sort of strength and vision came into me. It's all about Jesus, he said. And in that moment, it hit me that that wasn't just true for my intellectual questions or doubts or Old Testament class, but that was true for my whole life, my other passions, pursuits, and struggles. When viewing school or relationships or basketball or other experiences, I needed to stay focused on Jesus. The knowledge and experience that college offered could never make me somebody in the way I was searching for. In working hard at basketball or academics or relationships or being cool could not make me somebody either. But Jesus' work on the cross had already done that, and I was missing its far-reaching implications. He took the sin and failure and shame of my selfish strivings and all of its consequences on himself and he gave me the status of somebody. Beloved child of God, follower of Jesus, one of God's masterpieces created to do good work just like God does. And I needed to live out of that identity instead of trying to find a new one. But did you notice that Paul says that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, or Jesus, I think that this means more than just knowing about Jesus. The height of what Paul wants the Colossians and us to experience is knowing Jesus in personal relationship with him. Jesus says that eternal life is knowing him and the Father who sent him. That moment of peace and strength and vision that I experienced when Andrew said those words that moment could be my experience on the regular if I could learn to live in ongoing relationship with Jesus and feel the presence of his spirit in an ongoing way. When we know Jesus first and foremost, we will pursue all other wisdom and knowledge differently. Instead of pursuing them as a sort of savior or false solution, we can see other wisdom and knowledge for what they are gifts from a good creator, means of bringing good to the world and joining God's work, things to discover and enjoy and marvel and wonder and worship at. Because any wisdom or knowledge finds its substance in him, its truth in him. And we begin to discover that when we live in relationship with him. That's what it means that all wisdom and knowledge is hidden in him. As the author N.T. Wright says, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually a part of the drama which has him as the central character. So that connects to our big idea for today, and that is this. Knowing Jesus transcends our other knowing. And I would add, and knowing other Christians helps us know Jesus more. So I ask you, what current cultural wisdom or knowledge do you need Jesus to shine next to? What do we need Jesus to shine next to? so we can see it more clearly and master it for his good purposes instead of it mastering us. Because knowing Jesus illuminates the knowledge and wisdom around us, helping us see it for what it really is instead of being deceived. And who are the Christians you can grow closer to in this season? Are you moving towards them, away from them, you may need that more than you think. In fact, you probably do. I'm learning from this passage and the season I'm in that I still need Christian relationship more than I think, and probably a lot more than I think. 
So when we frame it this way, this passage is largely about relationship. It seems that it's about wisdom and knowledge, but that wisdom and knowledge is connected to relationship with God and with other Christians. It also seems that it's about, th- about mystery and things that are hidden, but if we unpack that a bit, we can see that that's also connected to relationship. So Paul calls Jesus the mystery of God. What God was doing in the story of the Old Testament was a mystery until it was revealed in the person of Jesus, who would not just share the right wisdom and knowledge, but ultimately invites us into relationship with him and dies to make that forever possible. Jesus said at one point, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. God doesn't mostly want us to just be smarter or know the right things. He wants relationship. He wants us to first be like children because that's who we are to him. We're his kids. He wants to be known by us as children know a good father. That's the healthy relationship we're created for. And I think he also uses mystery to teach us that he is God and we are not because we forget that like a lot like probably twice a minute at least when god's plan and wisdom and knowledge are hidden until they are revealed we are in a position of dependence and humility we are just human creatures humble before our creator dependent on his revealing his provision and his love and that's our last point for today The mysteries of God invite us to be humble and childlike with Him. So as some of you may know, my family was part of the Imago Dei church plant on 52nd and North, right next to Wauwatosa, uh, for the last almost decade. And last December, we had to close because of a succession of unforeseen challenges. And honestly, I would say all of us or the vast majority did not see it coming or even could not have dreamed um, what would happen. I had been on staff there part-time for almost five years, and my family had been deeply invested in the life of that community. And in the process, we had many close friends move away. I thought I knew where we were going in life, but suddenly the way seemed foggy. And it was really hard. It's still hard. So when we were up north last week, most mornings I would wake up early and go fishing on my paddleboard, which is an adventure. And one morning, it was a beautiful morning with like this beautiful, subtle haze on the pine trees. And as the sun was coming up, I stopped fishing and just paddled towards the sunset to get a good view. And I took in the sunset, and then I turned around to paddle back And immediately I saw this, that haze had moved in behind me and suddenly the way was lost. You couldn't see anything. That's a bit how my life has felt the last two years. Maybe some of you can relate. You've had experiences like that or are having an experience like that right now. But this passage encourages me that these experiences are inviting me and us to be humble and childlike before God in ways that otherwise aren't possible. They are inviting us into deeper relationship with Him in this season, and that is what we need. It's what I needed 20 years ago, and it's what I need now. It's what we need now. And I still need relationship and connection with other Christians. Because of our church and life transitions, I've been the most disconnected from Christian community that I've been in 20 years from before I met Andrew. I might think I need the knowledge of wisdom and wisdom from books or that our culture can provide, but I don't need that as much as I need relationship. And this passage definitely spoke that to my heart and I needed to hear it. And now I need to respond. So what about you? In this season, How is God inviting you to greater relationship with him? On your foggy mornings, 
What's he doing there? How is he inviting you into greater, greater relationship with other Christians? And what's that look like? And what discipline might help you with that? In our final verse for today, verse 5, Paul commends the discipline of the Colossians, probably because it helps them stay rooted in relationship. So what next step will help you stay rooted in relationship? I hope you think about that today, maybe even as we close our service here as you go home. Let me pray. God, we thank you that more than giving us what we want, you give us what we need. And in that process, we uh, learn that that's what we wanted all along, is you in relationship with other people. And I thank you for pursuing us, not letting us be our own God. Um, and I just pray that you would direct each of us in our next steps to living in greater relationship with you and with other people for the joy of it. Amen.